Uh, yeah, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, I am not using the technologies that Diego just talked about uh, for this for this month of experiments. Um, I wanted it to be a little bit more accessible, so I was actually using uh, what you just brought up, which is uh, ARJS, and I was using um, uh, a bridge between A-Frame and ARJS specifically for all of these experiments. Um, but just to answer your question right off the bat, the, the limitations with this approach is that all the examples you're about to see um, are marker-based because the browser isn't capable of doing the types of uh, planar geometry or uh, uh, other sort of CV applications um, robustly enough yet um, without, th there, there are a whole bunch of technical uh, limitations for the moment. Um, but yeah, so this isn't gonna be a, a very technical talk, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the uh, A-frame and ARJS are the underlying uh, things. And I'm just gonna go through every day of my experiments uh, so to start with, I uh, created, I just took this uh, default component from A-Frame, uh, which is a torus knot, and played around with uh, animating the P and Q aspects of the torus. Um, and that was a pretty interesting little foray. Uh, as you can see, the sort of the origin of the scene is centered around that marker, the hero marker that you see in the background. Um, and that'll appear in every day's experiment. Um, for the for the second day, I, or, well, for the, re for the whole month, really, I knew I wanted to experiment with shaders as well and interaction. So I combined those uh, by uh, having this simple random noise shader. Uh, and every time you click, if you, uh, it's kind of hard to tell on this screen, but every time you click, uh, it turns black a little bit. And it, will, it would also change the amplitude of the shader. Um, so that was my first foray into interaction uh, over a little AR object. Uh, let me see if there's sound hooked up. No. Okay, it's fine. Uh, this was, uh, so th th it's still interesting to look at. Um, there's, I was generating a random word using uh, Rita.js, and I was taking advantage of the native uh, speech API, browser speech API, um, and every time a rand uh, you would hit, you would hit the screen, uh, a random word would appear and it would randomly uh, pick a pitch and a voice uh, to speak the word to you. Um, this one was fun. I wanted, let me start it forward. Uh, so I wanted an excuse to do something like vaguely educational. Uh, so I, uh, even though these are grossly out of scale, I, uh, I sort of put uh, the planets um, on on this, on this rotating axis, uh, and you, the slider, the little blue dial down there, uh, is actually, you can move with your finger, um, and that's how you navigate the offset of the scene. And at the very end here, I even included uh, Pluto with a very big caveat. Um, but yeah, this was fun because it, it, it was, it, it's, a, it's, it's a small AR scene, uh, but it's navigating a much larger space uh, within the confines of a phone. Um, this one was, ex was fun. I was uh, just ex playing around with uh, uh, sort of concentric uh, animations, uh, looping uh, through HSL space, and also like sort of just organizing nice little, uh, nice little scale, uh, scale, scale animations. Um, so this was, a, this was a day that I was particularly pressed for time, so I just combined two of my old experiments, uh, or not, actually not two of them. Um, I just com uh, edited the, f the second day's experiment. Um, and on this one, you, you can't see the interaction here, but I, you can slide, the f slide your finger back and forth across the, across the screen, uh, and it changes the scale of the little sphere. Did you say this is all ARJS and A-frame? Yeah. Cool. Um, this was another simple experiment. Uh, it's uh, creating an outline component uh, by just copying the mesh and then animating that mesh. Uh, and it also set the reason. The reason it's able to look like an outline is that the the purple purplish mesh uh, has a has its uh, shader inverted. Um, so this one was the one where I was particularly pressed for time and just combined my first and second day's experiments. Uh, and every time you click, it would randomly generate P and Q variables for that torus effect. And it would also, uh, again, it's kind of hard to see here, but if you, uh, especially if you see it up close, uh, it's generating random noise across the entire torus, or across, yeah, across the entire torus knot. Uh, so this was one that I t finally took advantage of the fact that ARJS can detect not just one marker, but multiple types of markers. 
um, and I chose to put the same artifact on both of them, uh, this little corgi gif uh, sort of spinning in a circle uh, with a bunch of animation. But yeah, I'm just manipulating the window, and I think that's a really interesting technique that uh, makes, makes the interactivity a little uh, sort of particularly interesting that day. Uh, this one, you can sort of see all the offset alignment issues that come natively with uh, ARJS, at least with the platform that I was using it on. Uh, but I was trying to just animate a simple, uh, animate a little GIF on top of the marker, sort of mirroring the marker. Uh, this is one that I hope to revisit someday. Uh, this one was fun. So based on that Corgi experiment, I got the idea to recreate one of the first Zoetrope animations. Uh, and so what I'm doing is just placing the frames in a, in a uh, sort of the 12 frames in a circle, and then uh, modulating their, uh, the frame count every frame uh, so that it sort of recreates the effect of a torus, but sort of just floating in front of the computer screen. Um, I took some open source uh, motion capture data from the CMU mocap database. Um, and the reason, th this was fun too, because I decided to actually cover up the, cover up the marker on this day. So, if just looking at this video artifact, uh, it actually doesn't look like it's marker-based, and that was a really nice effect. Uh, sort of it just looked like, quote unquote, true AR. Um, this was me experimenting with some old uh, Connect point cloud data uh, that was scaled out, uh, and I actually had to move back pretty far, and it's impressive that tracking uh, lasted for something like five feet, um, just focusing on my laptop screen. Uh, but yeah, I'm modulating or I'm animating the, uh, the p every point uh, in the data set and its color and its scale, every frame. Uh, so this was, I got particularly fascinated with a, a pattern called 10 print, um, which is uh, a really simple generative uh, pattern uh, using uh, forward slashes or back slashes. And so I recreated the same thing, but using boxes in A frame and I'm just stacking them and assigning them a random color. Uh, and I got particularly enamored with this because the next day I did the same thing, but using a different angle, uh, 90 segments of 90 or 45, no, 90 degrees, um, and uh, cylinders. And then I'm just uh, changing the lightness value uh, on this one. And then I did the same thing again, uh, but I brought back that slider at the bottom. Um, but this time the slider is determining whether or not a random torus in this quote unquote 10 print uh, pattern will show up. Um, and so that sort of completed uh, the, it brought back old, the, the old interactivity pattern as well as uh, introducing this sort of uh, building upon this same pattern idea. Uh, so this was a collaboration uh, or a, a piece that I did using uh, uh, a, the press tube uh, imaginary organs set, uh, which is sort of this uh, just open source uh, VR, um, VR uh, 3D models um, that I imported, uh, not as GLTFs, which is why they're sort of loading so slowly in this scene, but I've since converted them to GLTFs and I plan on redoing this, uh, redoing this scene. Uh, but yeah, every time you click, uh, it sort of loads a random organ and it's, yeah, it scales it uh, sort of in this like uh, in out bounce animation. Um, this was another collaboration I did with an Instagram artist named Neil Sinke. Um, and I took, originally, it, this was a, just a flat illustration, and I took it into Photoshop and I cut it up into two layers, and sort of I put the layers one, one, over, one, over, one over each other, uh, such that when the scene first loads, they, it, it looks like the, the art is lined up, but then as you can see, as I move around here, um, the, you can see how sort of the, the dimensionality of the work uh, that I brought by actually putting it into AR. Um, I was inspired by the same technique, and so I just made some random arcs in Illustrator uh, and threw them in, and I think that's, it's just five layers that are just animating with a delay. Um, this was a collaboration with an artist named uh, Trauma Doll, and she works with a lot of layers normally, so I compressed a lot of them down into something like three layers here, uh, and I'm just animating their positions uh, one over each other. Uh, this was another experiment uh, using art that I made. Um, this was interesting because I'm, uh, the way that these are fading out isn't sort of just a binary on or off, but rather, rather the opacities are going from zero to one. And so because each layer has within it different opacity levels, uh, it looks like they're sort of bleeding into the scene. Um, this created a really interesting effect. 
Uh, this was an idea that I had for, uh, I eventually want to do a series of AR comics. Um, and so this is a drawing next to the hero marker. And then you can see once I zoom out that uh, over top this skull appears the AR scene, which I intended to be something like the face that the skull once belonged to. Um, yeah, and I plan on building a whole series out of this. Um, here I was using the 3D, uh, 3D.io API, um, which is a sort of a uh, interior design uh, 3D uh, API um, that I was just pulling random pieces of furniture from uh, and loading them and sort of just rotating them around the marker, um, which was really fun. And for these particularly small pieces, I could zoom in, as you'll see, in two seconds. Nope. Over here. There we go. Yeah. Um, this was my second collaboration with Trauma Doll. I uh, decided to give each of the layers opacity uh, to recreate the effect of her original work. And I just liked sliding them in and out horizontally rather than vertically this time. And I think it created a really interesting, interesting effect with the light shimmering behind it. Um, this was interesting. I pulled, uh, the Internet Archive has a database of uh, GIFs from Netscape, Net, Net, uh, um, sorry, not Netscape, um, a library of GIFs from uh, GeoCities. Um, and so I pulled uh, something like 30 of them. And uh, every time I click on the screen, uh, yeah, I really like this moment where I just, all those black flashes are me tapping. So I just add a ridiculous number of them and actually, uh, it, they handle artifacting really well. Uh, they do some really ridiculous things right here uh, where the GIFs uh, sort of are Z fighting with each other. Um, but yeah, this was interesting because it recreated a really interesting effect. And uh, as you can see, I'm pretty far away from the marker. So they take up a really large volume of space, uh, even though they're all just 2D GIFs. Um, this is an experiment that I did. I, uh, but it, it should be self-evident that it's, uh, it's a paper airplane sort of floating along its own trail. Um, the trail is generated using uh, two A-frame components and I just drew the, the plane in Photoshop and then it's, uh, it, has a double, uh, it has a double texture so that it appears on what it, regardless of what side you're looking at it from. Uh, this was the day that Stranger Things 2 came out uh, and <laughs> I, uh, I, I really like it uh, because the, the way I achieved that two-tone color effect was actually just using really strong red lighting in the background. Uh, and the, letter, the lettering is actually just geometry uh, that is uh, itself black. And then I used really strong lighting on the waffles as well to give them this really weird shimmery effect. Um, and this was my final collaboration with Trauma Doll. Uh, what's interesting about this one is that actually all of these layers are 2D. There's, these are just actually three, three planes with video textures on them. And then they're sort of, uh, they're animating over each other, uh, fighting for different positions in space. Uh, this was a prototype for a birthday card that I did. Um, and this was just uh, balloons following a track and then randomly generating a color. Uh, I used one balloon picture, and then I, I used a frame to animate the pick a random color and uh, send them off. So that was that was a really created a really nice effect. Um, this one's hard to t it's kind of hard to tell what's going on here, uh, but hopefully, as you see over time, uh, you'll see what's happening. Um, every few seconds, uh, three points are generated, and one point is taken away, and the uh, along the cur along these points form a curve. Um, uh, Camel Clark curve, and I'm cloning an object, uh, this like sort of little like flat rectangle plane. Um, and the reason they're changing colors is because there's a blue, a purple, and a red light in the scene. And as the sculpture, I conceived it as a sculpture, um, as it rotates around the scene, um, it creates this really interesting effect, uh, and then it also dynamically updates every few seconds. And then the last day of October was Halloween, so I felt obligatory uh, to do a Halloween-y thing. Um, so I took this really large GLTF uh, skull, or sorry, not skull, uh, jack-o'-lantern, and I put this uh, little little candle. Um, it's just a cylinder, a white cylinder with a light on it, with a light object attached to it, um, and it's following a random curve uh, within the path of the skull. And I really like this one because I made the pumpkin large enough that you could actually sort of walk, like hold 
as you see towards the middle, yeah, the, about the middle of this uh, video, um, I can actually hold up my phone to the pumpkin. Um, so yeah, those were, those were a very hasty rundown of all of my uh, pure ARJS uh, um, experiments. Uh, those all run on anything that runs iOS 11, and then a slew, something like a third or a fourth of Android phones. Uh, so I can, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more accessible than the, uh, the APIs that Diego was talking about. Um, but speaking of which, I have been playing around with those as well. Uh, and this is just a smattering of some of the work that I've been doing over, I think, the past month uh, experimenting with that. Uh, this one on the left is the most recent one that I've done, which is sort of a, uh, I still need to incorporate a bloom filter, but it's a, uh, it's supposed to be Christmas lights, and it's actually a tool where every time you click on the phone, uh, it generates a point, and, it, and, and the, the Christmas lights sort of string around uh, those points. Um, but yeah, that's all the uh, web AR work that I've been doing recently. Um, and it's, uh, it's beginning to be, it's not very crowded space, but uh, it's, there, there are enough tools now that I've created this gist of uh, web AR tooling, uh, and so if you have Anything that I've missed here, uh, feel free to come up to me afterward, uh, and we can talk about it. Um, and yeah, that's that's all I have. Any questions? questions? Yeah. Um, so the first question yeah. is, I think this is working. Um, first question is, would you be able to show us any of the code for one or two of the projects? Yeah. So let's see if. Yeah, so if you look at the URL for all of these, um, if you go to, uh, so I built all of these on Glitch, uh, and so if you actually go, I didn't, I didn't put it anywhere in this presentation, but I can put it up on the, in the meetup link. Um, if you go to glitch.com slash A-R-E-X-P, um, or tilde A-R-E-X-P, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link out for this. Um, you can actually fork this entire project yourself and also look at all the code um, in a like a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a web uh, web editor. Um, sure. Yeah. Let's. Sorry, no, it's fine. Uh, let's. Uh, it's it would be this URL uh, glitch.com slash tilde arexp. And then view source. And let's just take a look at the first one. Oh, I didn't name these chronologically. Okay, let's look at the pirouette ones. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot happening, um, including a bunch of scripts. Um, let me actually, okay, that's sort of readable. Okay, there we go. Uh, including a bunch of scripts. Um, yeah, so this was the, I forget what day this was, but yeah, this was the, uh, the dancer uh, dancing on top of a pink, uh, pink uh, plane. Um, so I made this custom, uh, this little A-frame component, which is actually just a really thin wrapper over the three code that brings in, um, that brings in the BVH file, uh, which is the motion capture um, skeleton. And then, uh, yeah, I create some spheres over each of the bones. Um, let's see. Uh, and this is the actual, this is all the A-frame the, the A markup that uh, compiles the scene. Um, so actually, the reason I was able to do one of these every day is because it really only took, after, after sort of figuring out the, the three that I wanted to, the three JS code that I wanted to execute, um, doing the implementing it all over top the A-frame anchor was as simple as actually adding the default anchor tag that's exposed by the A-frame ARJS bridge. Um, so that was, this is, this is really all the markup that it took to create that once I had the component. Um, and the, compo the custom component was as simple as adding this little attribute right here. Oh, sure. Especially since you embedded inside of it. Yeah, so. It's a third-person piece inside of it. You can see that was really. Yeah, so the. It was actually, I mean, it's pretty simple. The I made the pumpkin, let's see. 
where did it go? Right here. So I just made the pumpkin very large. Uh, and at this scale, a meter, uh, so A-frame by default uses meter scaling. Um, so it's, it takes up a meter uh, of the scene by default. And then I wrote a series of uh, points. Um, I generated these points uh, using a macro in Vim. Um, and the, I just made sure that all these points were smaller than the, uh, the area that I knew that the pumpkin would take up. Um, and so that, that candle uh, just follows all of these curve points. Um, and yeah, so there's no, there, there wasn't actually any complicated like nesting logic. It was really just a, a matter of manually placing that path within. Yeah. Sure. So let's see, where is it in here? Uh, so the way that, uh, let's see, one, that's a little bit easier to see. Yeah. So the way that this, this scene gets, uh, gets anchored to the scene, uh, for, it's kind of hard to talk about this stuff, uh, the, is that this, this anchor acts as, um, as sort of the origin point of the scene. And so instead of placing everything uh, relative to the camera, the camera itself actually stays static. And then I placed everything inside of this A anchor tag. And the anchor, uh, by default, is something that ARJS will look for. Uh, it'll look for a marker. And I could set a custom marker, but I was using the default one, which was, the, again, this hero marker. Um, and under the hood, uh, an anchor is uh, simply a collection of uh, points that uh, sort of have to match uh, a, certain, a certain number of features. Um, and so the syntax, because A-frame is more declarative syntax, uh, the syntax here is to actually nest everything underneath this anchor tag. Can you talk a little bit about anchors in Yeah. Uh, so I forget what day that was. Let me actually. Uh, wherever the Corgi experiment was, I think it was this one. Yeah. So yeah, here I'm actually, it's kind of difficult to tell because everything's sort of moving on top of it, obviously, but this, one, this I basically copied, uh, copied the code that was running, that was creating these Corgis, and I said that I set one to be the hero anchor, and I set one to be the kanji anchor. I can actually go see if I can find what, what experiment that was. Yeah, let me see if I can find it really quick. I might have called it Corgi something. Gift test. Let's see. Yeah, so it was as easy. So by default, what I do is just say A anchor, and that, that, and that would by default look for the hero marker. Um, and so adding a different preset, uh, there's also ways to generate your own, your own type uh, images and anchors. Um, but I used a different preset that comes with ARJS, which is actually a port of a, a C++ library called AR Toolkit. Um, and I used this, and it was as simple as setting uh, preset equals kanji. And then that was looking for this marker over here uh, with the kanji lettering in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah, I've seen multiple proposals for SLAM and for monocular depth filtering, um, just single camera filtering. Um, I've I've been researching a few papers on it, and it's it's definitely possible. But it's the question of whether or not it would be performant to do that sixty times a second um, is, is 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 a really big is a really big question, right? And it's a different question. Um, and so I think we're getting closer, uh, especially as the average smartphone gets more powerful. Um, but I do think that projects that hook into ARKit and ARCore um, 
are right now are doing exactly what they should be doing, which is allowing people like me to prototype uh, with those systems and eventually something like the standard WebXR or immersive polyfill, um, sorry, immersive API, web immersive API um, will handle doing that at the browser, right? But that's, that's going to be something, that's going to be something that C++ needs to handle, and so that's going to be something that the browser needs to handle, uh, which is, yeah, at, along the way, uh, it'll be, it would be much faster doing it at that level. So yeah, it, it, it's, my answer is that I don't think it's going to be performant or efficient or interesting to do it in JavaScript right yeah, now. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Anyone else? Sure. Uh, so say it again. Yeah, I think I think one thing that's definitely possible. Um, I didn't actually. It was interesting. I have different experiments that uh, that do things like a uh, faux refraction um, or uh, take advantage of. Uh, uh, ray marching um, against the position of the camera uh, to do things like faux uh, Z detection. Um, but those things, like doing those things was really fun, but also way harder than it should have been. Um, and so building primitives out for more complicated shader logic, building primitives for ray marching tools, uh, I think, I, I, also, I also recognize that those features are like incredibly, com like in they're incredibly complex and so they're incredibly hard to simplify. Um, which is why I don't, I don't, I don't ask too much in that space because I do think this is still like, it's really, it's really new tooling. Period. Um, it's really hard for me to uh, sort of gripe about the fact that there aren't these really complicated, uh, really simplified tools for really complicated tooling. Yeah. Do one more question. I'll ask. I'll ask a question then. Okay. So for the folks in the room that are working on some of the new. Let's say native, maybe the AR, AR core stuff. Um, are there any thoughts to still have marker based features? So, I think one of the fancy terms people use is like localization to know like where I want to put something in the room. Is there any thought on that's the L in slams? Does that make any sense or is that a crazy no. thought? No, it makes sense because uh, it, it's definitely interesting and it's something that we are uh, researching on because for now. Not even just um, uh, like tracking itself, but just like identifying that there is something in the scene that triggers an AR experience could be very interesting. Uh, and also, of course, if you if you can have some post estimation based on the on the marker, you could use it as an anchor to specify that that's the origin of the experience, and then you can localize it in a room. For example, you can place a marker here and do a, an AR experience that is completely su su suitable for this room, right? It has been prepared for this room. Uh, and the marker ha should stay in that position, right? Because that would be the origin of it, so. Yeah. Things like that, so it's per markers are pretty interesting in, at this stage of the technology. Yeah. yeah. Like an app that would recognize a product and, and put some augmentation on top of the product. So if you were like going through a store, you would, they w it would find different markers that were in the store as part of the merchandising of the store. And then it would recognize those and place appropriate augmentations in those spots, which if you're not doing marker-based stuff, you've got to do a whole lot of really strange kind of AI, I would suppose, to recognize, oh, this is a Pepsi can versus a Coke can, as opposed to just recognizing that's a Pepsi label. 
as opposed to a Coke label. So. Actually, I literally was looking at this today for a patent we were looking at for one of our customers, or partners actually, about letting people know that there's AR, VR, and you come to a marker in an actual physical space for marketing and other way, experiences, even if it's just navigation, then you can do a UI metaphor for it. Like, you know, when you go into an AR space here, this is the size of it, this is a space, and for gaming and stuff, specifically around AR and VR, where you have to actually have a certain amount of space they can move into, it's super important. But on the other side, it's also great too, if you wanna do like we actually have been throwing a UI over the VR when paying, and laying over UI and entry and exit to it to kind of letterbox the experience so people are used to entering the UI like the other UIs. It's so been, so mm -hmm. we have marker lists. We may go back and have markers again. Oh, well, yeah, so <laughs> one, <laughs> one way, one, yeah, so I mean, the markers here, I think one, one of the things that has uh, sort of kept people from doing this approach is that the, these markers, in order to be performant, are really simple and have to be black and white and have to be pretty large. Uh, but I do think that the, the sort of the middle ground um, for localization and for performance uh, is gonna be uh, a little bit more complex definition of a marker. So right, eventually a marker could be something like my face. Eventually a marker could be something like a Pepsi label. Um, yeah, it's really, really complicated, uh, really complicated features that can still be boiled down into features that you can detect and okay. localize over. Um, and I mean, if, you, if you use like the Vuforia libraries mm -hmm. and stuff, you can pretty much turn any image into a marker and, and it'll just use the, like, they've got this great one which is a, basically a picture of a bunch of little rocks. Yeah. And it's a, a photo of rocks and you can use that as a marker and it detects that. Yeah, you basically um, need either a lot of contrast or a lot of contours, ideally both, but you can get yeah. away with enough with really complicated right. computer and they, vision. They've, they, and they've done a lot of stuff with, with catalogs. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, recognizing not like fiduciary markers, but actually recognizing product images. Yeah. So that as you go through the catalog, it recognizes, oh, that's a that's a whatever, and you get a little spin, you know, a, a turntable of it. Yeah. Um, I think IKEA and the, is done. And the hope is that that, lo that 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 technology will become democratized because right now it's something like five hundred dollars per license for Vuforia. Yeah. Well, it used to be free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it helps with video. Like it, we actually use a little image on the corner, like you would, like you navigate a game, and literally, um, we're able to tell people's orientation. I find like just myself, and we're doing the VR, it keeps me from getting fused because I start our because ours is in the browser, which just lets us see like literally you move it and your orientation changes. You get confused, so it's just a little bit of UI, a little bit of that orange XYZ space orientation. I think is going to go a long way. And with overlays like this, we can give people visual cues and even motion cues that are tied to GPS off the hardware and the devices in the browser. So that's a cool thing. Because at the end of the day, we know on both sides, instead of apps, we're going to be embedding web resources anyway. So anybody in app stuff is telling you oh, it's going to be all app, they're full of shit. Excuse my French, but yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. All right, well, uh, I think that's over our one, one last question. Uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you anymore. very much for listening to me ramble. Oh, through. I was going to ask, what performance issues did you see the sweet spots for? I forgot to ask that, sorry. Oh, uh, I, I mean, everything I did was uh, performance, performance gets, basically the only hang up with ARJS right now, um, that, well, this isn't true. The only performance issue that I hit regularly is poly count, so a lot of these demos uh, were just uh, restricting poly count. So how many is a good sweet spot? I don't. I don't. I haven't done the actual test. I just noticed above some arbitrary, some some eyeball threshold. Um, it, yeah. So I just I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of culling uh, every frame um, to get around it. Uh, that was the only uh, performance issue. Cool. Thank you, Andre. Yeah.